Follow the light. The light is your guide. Brian Lee O'Malley lives a life you might call familiar if you've seen his work. He was a comic artist who lived in Toronto, Canada. He played in a band, had a cool gay roommate, and a host of complicated emotions. He was starting work on his newest story, then unnamed. His roommate gifted him a satirical book called Even a Monkey Can Draw Manga. Manga had typically no presence in North America back in 2002, but Brian loved what he had managed to get his hands on. These hot-headed, idiotic main characters were not only fun to write, but entertaining to watch. Everything all fell into place when he was listening to a favorite band of his, Plumtree. A lyric from a recent song of theirs deeply resonated with him. I've liked you for a thousand years. The song? Scott Pilgrim. Scott. Scott. Scott! Scott Pilgrim! I normally wouldn't start a movie review with so much background about the creator, but Scott Pilgrim's origins are, in my opinion, invaluable context to this video. This film would go on to be one of the most influential films of the 2010s, and it's because of Scott Pilgrim's birth from influence. The Japanese manga inspiration, the comic and video game aesthetics, the main character's namesake, even his life were all inspired. It's clear that this story feels so emotionally resonant and grounded despite how zany it is because of all this real life connection. I find a lot of the time when a story follows a plot similar to something that's actually happened to the author, the story always feels so tangible and personal, unapologetically human. But with such a rich source material like the Scott Pilgrim graphic novels, you'd think making a film out of this would be a fool's endeavor. The comic book and video game styling would just be so complicated to bring into the medium of cinema, not only lacking the soul and life of the originals, but just feeling rushed. The events of Scott's journey take place over an entire year or more of his life, stretching over six full books. For almost any director on earth, adapting these books into a single cohesive film would be a nightmare. But I said, almost any director. How do you feel now that you've peaked? You, I don't know that like- uh, This is Edgar Wright, the director of Scott Pilgrim. Thank you. Jonah, do you think it's important to be unattractive to be funny? <sighs> Can skinny people be funny? It's okay. Are you just a fucking asshole? Are you, I, I, I don't understand. Can you just ask a normal question? I think we've got off on the wrong foot here. I just wanted to sort of like ask, you know, let, let's keep the questions light. Can skinny people really be funny? Because Jonah is clearly more funny than you in the film, Michael. This is Edgar Wright, and it's clear from not even the opening scene, but the opening logos that he had a vision for this film. Start to finish, this movie is oozing with style and flavor, wearing influence on its sleeve, or rather its tricolored sweatband. As cringe-inducing as this word's connotation has become in the last decade, a great word to describe Edgar Wright's film style with this movie is quirky. This film is full of little unique quirks that just make the film feel fresh, even if you've seen it a million times. There's personalized little title cards for each character with a ranking the first time they're on screen. Sound effects put giant comic book gaudy text behind the characters. Perspective play is commonplace all over this film. Even the smallest thing, Scott Peeing has a video game graphic. Aubrey Plaza's character, Julie, just has a f***ing censor bar when she curses and it's real. Like, it's like it's just accepted. How are you doing that with your mouth? Never mind how I'm doing it! But before I spend minutes on end ranting about what makes this an unparalleled viewing experience, who is Scott Pilgrim? Not so long ago... You were saying? Scott Pilgrim was dating a high schooler. Uh, well... Scott is a selfish, pathetic, slightly egotistical asshole. But why do we like Scott even though he's the salt of the earth? Well, the secret sauce is all in the writing. All the characters in this story are flawed, but humanly so, and are always funny and charismatic enough to be endearing. It's easy to pick Scott apart just because of how much screen time he has, but almost every character in this movie is kind of a dick. I've dabbled in being a bitch. It's part of the reason I moved here. Not Kim though, she perfect. It's implied Scott is clinically bad with women despite pulling so many, somehow, looking like this, and is a bit of a heartbreaker. And now more than ever, with his recent big breakup at the hands of Envy, Scott is a ball of romantic anxiety that has no idea how to treat himself most of the time, let alone any of these women. Scott is stuck between jobs, stuck between girls, stuck between living situations. Ramona is stuck between cities and men alike. This movie is about those awkward and uncertain transitional periods in your life. In his regular life, Scott feels disconnected and not special. He's a zero. He's a nobody. He's the bass player and backup vocalist to a band nobody knows, but Ramona gives him some feeling of purpose. Later, we get this lovely shot of Scott talking to Ramona, white-knuckling his red solo cup, while he awkwardly spits out a gaming fact as some sort of icebreaker. 
This sort of thing worked on Knives, who was not only more easily impressed, but just more enthusiastic about Scott's interests in general, in contrast to how Ramona obviously just thinks he's weird. But strangely enough, Scott actually enjoys having to try like this, despite her being so out of his reach, which, if you haven't noticed it yet, is why this light switch is 10 feet off the ground in the background, literally out of Scott's reach. That Edgar Wright, I tell ya. Him and those props department boys really, you know, get me going. He invites her to a show they're playing that night, but when Knives also shows up and they start talking, Scott realizes just how much deep shit he's in. At this point in the film, the average person is interested in the wacky presentation of the movie, sure, but at the end of the day, this is all pretty standard indie movie fare. But after the mental flashbang that is the sudden and insane escalation of things created by Matthew Patel's entrance, I don't understand how someone could get to this part of the movie and not be glued to the screen. Matthew is electric and quirky as hell and reveals the true plot of this movie, which is that Scott must defeat Ramona's seven evil exes. The evil exes are the best part of this, they're all comically extra. They're enchantingly campy, and it's hilarious that they're all self-aware enough to know that they're evil. Not only was I starstruck the first time I saw this because of this Bollywood boner jam he belts out, but because Michael Sarah is classically trained in martial arts? Michael Sarah being this badass anime hothead is a funny enough visual on its own, but what I think is even funnier is that this is totally shock value, as he never really fights like this again in the entire movie. Whether through music, or his girlfriend bailing him out, or simply outsmarting his opponent, he kind of just weasels his way out of every other conflict in the movie. Except for at the end, where he kills all of Gideon's innocent bodyguards. But let's take a break from the plot for a second. This movie is intoxicating, and I can't even imagine the theater experience. The lighting, music, choreography, dialogue, shot composition, every stylistic decision is a right one. This movie is infectious, it is consistently engaging from start to finish. Nearly every single transition in this film is something you've rarely seen before. Characters literally walk from one scene to the other. There's multiple times where instead of fading to black, they literally just have all the lights shut off. Even the regular shot transitions are all cut by people walking in front of the camera. All of this makes for a creative and snappy experience with little to no downtime. This fast pace is intriguing, sure, but thematically makes sense in this comic book world. Just like flipping a page, we don't see them traveling anywhere, just sort of warping to the next location while carrying the same conversation. There's multiple animated sections in this movie too, which show audiences what the original book looked like in a wonderful homage to them. This movie has one of the best OSTs to ever do it. Sex bob music was all written by Beck, and he was the perfect choice. Threshold, Garbage Truck, Launchpad McQuack. That's not the actual title. Of this. <laughs> The score to this film gets an instant 10 out of 10, and I haven't even mentioned that it gifted us with the greatest song of all time! On the topic of Brie Larson here, a ton of celebrities are in this, including five of my biggest celebrity crushes. Along with the perfect casting is the flawless costume design. Everybody has an outfit in this movie, Steven with western shirts, Scott of course with graphic tees, or Kim with track jackets. It makes them instantly iconic and very memorable. And I know personalized is a word that I've used a lot in this video, but it's everywhere! All of Wallace's clothes have his initials sewn into them. Guess who's drunk? I guess Wallace. You guessed right. Scott feels like a zero, so guess what his shirt says? His favorite drink is Coke Zero. Him being zero could also contrast the seven numbered evil X's, of course, like the first one being Matthew Patel. He's number one, so he's always pointing his index finger like a dork, and he has one chevron on his pirate jacket. Lucas Lee has a 2 tattoo, a 2 on his trailer, a 2 on his car, he points with 2 fingers, and he gets sloppy seconds. Todd has a 3 shirt with 3 stripes, his final note echoes 3 times and smashes Scott through 3 walls. He also had 3 strikes to his vegan powers, but that's a whole different can of worms. Can vegans eat worms? I partake not in the meat of any creature with a face. Face? Whoa! <laughs> Who's that guy? Roxy dies because of foreplay? I, I don't know. The twins? Uh, five and six. Um, uh, I don't know. They kind of just forgot in this part of the movie, to be honest. Well, what about Gideon? Made me swallow my gum. It's gonna be in my digestive tract for seven years! I'm counting that. Then finally, when Scott has his big moment of self-actualization, he has his plum tree Scott Pilgrim shirt on. All these little details and filmmaking tricks surely make the whole experience feel more deliberate and alive, but the real heart of the film will always be found in the script, and this one is no different. The dialogue in this movie makes it what it is. 
There are these giant performances with these wacky characters who have long rants of unrealistic dialogue that no human would ever say. But the script is also full of these little moments of reality where the reactions seem painfully genuine. Hey. Hey, Scott. Envy? Oh, shit. In my opinion, all the performances are nailed, no matter how small. Every line delivery is about as perfect as it could be. Every move feels so deliberate. It feels like they got the best take every time they picked up the camera. And I'd be remiss not to mention how funny this movie is, but when trying to describe the comedy, I realized this movie is incredibly comedically broad. There's slapstick humor, dry wit, situational comedy, parody, physical comedy. As if despite its narrow premise, it casts this massive net of humor. I truly think that anyone could get a laugh out of this movie. Even if you aren't a teen struggling through a rapidly changing life, this film has a lot of other very prevalent and important themes. Like growth and emotional maturity. Scott goes into this boss battle fighting for love, and he loses and it costs him his life. Luckily he has another and he goes back, and when he does he chooses to instead fight for himself. Self-respect and growth in general have been in the whole runtime, but it really culminates in the end here with Scott literally getting the video game good ending. He does right by everyone around him, and admits responsibility for himself. I think someone who sports this theme even better than Scott though would be Knives. She starts this film very emotionally vulnerable, but ends it being perhaps the most emotionally mature, being the one to tell Scott not to just let Ramona walk away. Another great visualization of self-respect is Nega Scott, who Scott doesn't even need to fight since he's resolved his problems with his own image after fighting this human version of Plankton. I'm getting a little lost in the sauce here ranting about how well executed this whole movie is, but that begs the question, is there anything I don't like about it? Well, yeah, but not a whole lot. First and foremost, the second half of this movie just doesn't really have the same magic as the first half for me. The first three evil exes are all flawless segments of this film and I wouldn't touch them at all, but Roxy, especially the Katayanagi twins, and Gideon just feel sort of speed ran through. And I think the reason this is is because the movie and the books were actually being produced at the same time. The fifth book was in the works during the production of the movie, and the sixth book came out after its release and has a whole different ending. Of course, Brian Lee O'Malley and Edgar Wright still talked about what should happen, surely, but it's clear, at least to me, that the direction just wasn't as clear. This movie is only an hour and 42 minutes, which nowadays is pretty damn short for a feature-length film, let alone one trying to adapt six entire books. The pacing of this movie is just fast enough and the writing is snappy enough that an extra 20 minutes on this movie would just fly by. What would I put there, though? I mean, in the book, the Katayanagi twins kidnap Kim and Scott has to fight multiple robots to save her. The Scott Pilgrim game adapts this perfectly. That would have been great to see. To be truthful with you, Kim just needed more screen time in general. She's hardly a character. At least she gets to talk though, unlike these two knuckleheads who literally have no dialogue. The book also gives Steven much more of a character and even a love interest. Ramona vs. Roxy could have been twice as long and we could have even gotten that iconic moment where Scott hides in Ramona's subspace purse, which could have been a great opportunity to validate the purpose of putting subspace in this movie to begin with. So yeah, Ramona can roller skate through space itself, and can travel over 3 miles in 15 seconds. Surely this is something they'll explain in detail, and utilize within the script effectively, and it'll have major- What? Yeah, this is one of my only complaints, and I won't go too deep into it, but the whole subspace highway thing is the only thing that feels unrefined to me in this movie. Subspace has a big presence in the sixth book, but is largely unexplained in the film. It's supposed to be a sort of warp door, like a pipe in Mario or something, but they don't really portray it like that in the movie. I understand its inclusion, but if someone outside the video game world watches this film, they just have to accept that Ramona can do this. I know all of this is really nitpicky, but those are really my only legitimate criticisms. And part of me feels like these aren't even real criticisms, because is leaving me wanting more really something to critique? Maybe wanting more is what's been drawing us back to this movie for more than a decade now. This film is obviously important to me, and it was my favorite for many years after I saw it. I don't really expect a lot of my other movie reviews to be as essay style as this one was, but my fondness of this story more than warranted it. I'm really having to stop myself too, there's so much more to talk about, a film this eclectic cannot be done justice by a little pink moth in 15 minutes. So go watch it! With this being the second movie I'm reviewing on this channel, after The Breakfast Club, I thought I'd compare the two. Hell, maybe one day I'll rank every movie ever made slowly. But you gotta start somewhere. So how does this one fit into the massive and expansive list I've accrued so far? And Scott Pilgrim wins! Top of the leaderboard. As good as The Breakfast Club is, this movie is just too infectious. Have you ever heard the term labor of love? Like and subscribe if you enjoy the show, and if you like movies, check out the Tarantino Iceberg or The Breakfast Club review that Jalaman did last year. 
It still holds up, I hear, but maybe you should go find out. <laughs>